we're going to start off this morning by singing this power of the blood. And if you're physically able, you can stand, please. so much for this day. Lord, we thank you for waking us up, and getting us here, and Lord, as I pray, just about every Sunday, if we did not come in here prepared to worship, prepared to see you at work, to see you in action in our lives, and in the lives of brothers and sisters, I pray even as I speak that we're individually praying to you, asking you to calm our nerves, asking you to focus us on what we need to focus on, and that's worshiping you and lifting up your son, Jesus Christ so that we'll all be drawn closer to him. We'll be changed when we leave this place. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, while you're still standing, go you know, just a page back, page over, and then 158, and we're going to sing all four verses of nothing but the blood. There's a theme going here today, if you haven't picked up on it. <laughs> Yeah. 
Amen. Thank you. Amen. God's good. All the time. I'm kind of slow this morning. God's good. Oh, all the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Again, it's good to welcome everybody. Children's Church is dismissed. Good to welcome everybody here as we worship a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Good to see everybody here. I know we're dealing with a lot of stuff this weekend. we got a holiday weekend, and, and I know we've still got folks that are dealing with illnesses, and, and, and either they, they, they've got to be out because of COVID or they're, they're self-quarantining themselves. And we just praise the Lord that we've not gotten to the point uh, where we've had to cancel church. And uh, we just need to be praying for folks as, as they're out. Uh, that the Lord would, would touch them. And, and I know some of you guys have had some pretty tough bouts uh, with, with, with COVID and uh, thankful to see folks here that we've not seen in a few weeks. And uh, Miss Arlene and Miss Joyce, good to have you guys back. Want to recognize some, some, some friends uh, back there on the, the next to the last row. Uh, Michael Page and, and, uh, and his, his family, uh, his wife, Vonnie, and Vonnie's sister, Teresa, and 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 uh, Miss Lutz, uh, Miss Jane Lutz, they were at our first church uh, over at Zion, and uh, they came over here to worship today. Good to have you guys with us, and uh, uh, all the bad stories from Zion, you keep those to yourself, you know. And and uh, so hopefully I'll be able to be here a little while longer. But it's good to see everybody here today. And and uh, as you probably figured out, if you if you've looked at your bulletin, we're observing communion this morning. And so we're going to, our message is going to focus on that. And I want to take some time to pray right now before we get into it. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, thank you for new friends, for old friends. We thank you for folks that are, that are recovering from illnesses and are, and are back today. We, we thank you and pray for the folks that are, that are still home fighting it. I know Taylor and Sarah are still dealing with it. Uh, Brother Earl is in the hospital, and, and Lord, if things work out, looks like he's going to be able to come home tomorrow. So we, we thank you for that. And Lord, I know we've all got friends and loved ones that are, that are still dealing with, uh, with, with COVID. And I just pray for a, a minimal case and for a, a fast recovery. And, and uh, Lord, we love you this morning, and, and help us to show that in our, in our attitude as, we, as we've sung, uh, as we fellowship with each other, and as we get into the mes message. Lord, some of the, the things I want to lift up in prayer this morning... Uh, some of our ministries here at the church, Lord, I want to lift up our, our center shot and our, our youth ministries to you, Lord. Uh, thank you for Donnie and, and for Anita and Troy and Jeremy and Mark that head up our center shot ministries. And Lord, I know they're getting ready to wind down uh, from this fall session, but thank you for what they're doing. Uh, Lord, thank you for the, the lives that are being touched. And just pray you continue to use that. Lord, we pray for our men's ministry. We're going to be meeting the last... Uh, Saturday of this month, that's October 30th at, at 8.30 p.m., 8.30 a.m. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the, uh, not just the, the men of our church that are here, uh, that participate in it, Lord, but we thank you for the, uh, the, the men from other churches in the area that have been coming. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to bless it, continue to use it to draw us all together, Lord, so that we, not just so we can get together and eat and have a devotional, but Lord, to bring our churches together, that, that we can, uh, can, can, can develop a vision uh, on how collectively, uh, how combined we can, uh, we can reach a lost and dying Spotsylvania County with the gospel. Uh, Lord, we pray for our Tuesday morning Bible study, headed up by Pastor Carol. Lord, thank you for that. I, I have learned so much. Uh, in, in the past year or so that, that we've, I've been attending this. And just thank you for Pastor Carroll and his ministry there. Thank you for the Bible study. And Lord, pray that you grow that. We've got a, a group of about anywhere from 13 to 15 folks that are coming. But Lord, we've got, we've got more room for anybody that, that feels led to come. Lord, I want to pray for some of our pastors in the area. Lord, I pray for, uh, for, for Pastor Adam Blossom, Adam Blosser and the folks out at Goshen Baptist that you be with them today. And, and, uh, uh, Pastor Scott Quinn at Traveler's Rest. Lord, that you be with him, be with his people. Lord, they're, they're all dealing with the same things we deal with. But this morning, as, as they deliver the word, Father, I pray you give them love, you give them boldness, and that the name of Jesus is lifted up. Lord, I pray for us that you'd open our hearts and souls and minds this morning to the message you've got to give us as we take a look at Psalm 51. Lord, as I pray that we take this time before we go into the 
the, the portion where we celebrate communion, the Lord's table, that we would take time to confess our sin to you and that we would prepare our hearts so that we can partake in a worthy manner. Lord, bring encouragement where encouragement's needed, correction where correction's needed, but Lord, I pray especially that you bring Christ into the life of that one, those few, those many that are either here today or watching online in need of a Savior. And we'll be so quick to give you all the praise and honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to the Old Testament book of Psalms. Psalm 51. I'm going to be sharing that this morning. Talking about that this morning. And to just give you some background <clears throat> on what's going on here. Psalm 51 is written by David. And it, it's believed that it was the psalm that, that he wrote after he was finally convicted. Well, he had been convicted, but he'd been miserable in his sin, but he wrote this when he finally realized what he needed to do to have his sin forgiven. If you don't remember the sin, David committed sin by having an adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and then he compounded it when he found out Bathsheba was pregnant by basically having her husband Uriah killed. And biblical scholars think that it was about a year before Nathan finally came to him. And I won't go into the story as to how Nathan, how, how, what Nathan said, but Nathan came and spoke to David, and God's Holy Spirit worked on him, <clears throat> excuse me, and he realized he had to come clean, that he had to confess his sin to God and, and, and have that relationship uh, restored. And so David poured out his heart to God in confession and in repentance. And folks, the same thing's true of us today as we sin we, we not only have a God that, that's waiting for us to confess and repent, we need to want to do it. We need to be willing to, to do our part. You know, we might not be murderers or adulterers, but we've all got our own sin list that we need to deal with if we want an uninterrupted relationship with God and God's best for our lives. You know, we may not have to deal with adultery or murder, but the Apostle Paul speaks of sins we may be dealing with this morning. In, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. That's nobody here in this church, I'm sure, especially us guys. We don't lose our temper. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, drunkenness, debt, revelries, and the like. Those are more the kind of issues that we deal with in our day-to-day -day lives. And so we're going to be talking about confessing these things. If you have your Bibles and if you turn to Hymn 51, I'm just going to, I'm going to read down through verse 10. But we're going to be talking about most of the, uh, most of the psalm. If you're physically able, out of reverence to God's Word, if you'd stand, please. This is David speaking, and he writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make, known, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may, be, may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. May God bless us by the reading, the hearing, but most especially the doing of his words. You may be seated. <clears throat> Y'all bear with me just for a second. <clears throat> I used to tell you guys that I'm okay because I had my shots, but... I wonder sometimes if the shots aren't wearing out, <laughs> wearing off. One other passage I wanted to share when it, when it talks about the sins that we, uh, that we deal with today. It's out of Ephesians 4.29, and I just forgot this 
when I was reading the other passage. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. How many of us as Christians have got the, uh, I'll call it a pet sin of maybe using words that we shouldn't be using? You know, that, that, that's a sin too. And we need to ask God to deal, us, deal with us with that. But a uh, few things I want us to see here this morning. Uh, talking uh, about David is his cry for mercy, his confession of his sin, and his desire to be pure before God. And there were two or three other points I could have made uh, on, this message, uh, on this passage, but, it, but you could take weeks preaching on, on Psalm 51. But I just chose to, uh, to, to highlight these three points. But the first thing I want to talk about is, is David's cry for mercy in verses 1 and 2. We read, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now we see right at the get-go, if you will, that David was crying out to God for mercy. Now he wasn't crying out to God because he felt he deserved it. Now he wasn't saying, well, well, God, you know me. Hey, I'm the king of Israel. You know, and, and, and I've, I've worshipped you pretty regularly and consistently over my life so I think I've I've earned some some slack here so I'm just I'm I, you know so so you should forgive me he doesn't do that he cries out to God for mercy have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness now I can't think of a better combination you know of two words where you know we're in in the in the Halloween uh time of the year so you're seeing these Reese's peanut butter cup commercials all the time now and remember the old commercial used to be uh you, you, you take two great tastes and put them together you know chocolate and peanut butter and you get a great Reese cup well how, how about these for, for a word play loving and kindness and those are characteristics of God he's loving towards us and he shows kindness to us when we when we don't deserve it now whether David is the one that coined this phrase or not but that's an awesome word there loving kindness and he cries out to God for mercy, not based on David's righteousness, but based on God's loving kindness. When we sin, God could easily deal with us in his righteousness and in his holy anger and in his holy wrath. He could deal with us with justice and give us what we deserve, but we worship a merciful God, a God filled with love and with kindness and pardon to his children. <clears throat> And so we shouldn't hide like David did when we've committed sin. We should be running to him. And you've probably heard me say this, say this before. You know, God, God can deal with us in one of three ways. He can, there's justice, there's mercy, and there's grace. And, and the best way to, 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 to talk about those words in a, in a secular way would be, I'm driving down 208, and there's two or three cars that are going too slow, and, and so I... I pass three cars in a row. We all know that's illegal. I get pulled over by one of Spotsylvania's finest. Mr. Hodges, I don't care that you're the preacher at Hebron. You pass three cars when you're only supposed to pass one. Here's a ticket. He's issuing justice. Now, driving down the road past three cars, get pulled over by the sheriff's department. And the deputy says, well, Mr. Hodges, I could give you a ticket. Because what you did was illegal, but I'm not going to do it. Please drive more carefully. Have a good day. He had mercy on me. Now, I'm driving down the road, past three cars. Deputy Sheriff pulls me over. Mr. Hodgin, I really should be giving you a ticket, but I'm in a good mood today. I'm not going to do it. And, oh, hey, by the way, here's a $100 gift card to Outback Steakhouse. Take your wife out there tonight and have a good time. That's grace. That's giving me something that I didn't deserve. And that's the way God deals with us. He, he, he can deal with us in justice. I know somebody said something, but my, my ears are plugged up, so I'm, not, uh, I'm not, not tracking it very well. You know, God could deal with us in justice, give us what we deserve. God could deal with us in mercy, not giving us what we deserve. But I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I've noticed in my walk with him that time after time after time, he deals with me in grace. And he gives me what I, what I don't deserve. So when we sin, instead of running from him, we should be running to him. 
It took David a while, but he finally, Nathan, you know, sometimes we have to have other people. We may feel the Holy Spirit, but we try to ignore it. And sometimes God puts other people in our lives. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I talked about my dear wife last week, you know, or it might have been Wednesday night. You know, God, God's Holy Spirit oftentimes uses her if, if, I, if there's something I don't want to deal with. I think I shared Wednesday night, I don't think it was last Sunday, you know, sometimes I might lose my temper. And Tammy, like, you need to calm down. I know I need to calm down, but I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'm wanting to pitch a fit. You know, I, I deserve this. I earned it. And then all of a sudden she goes, well, Pastor Hodgson, how do you think your congregation would react if they, if they were to see you right now? You know. And then I get that conviction that was always, always there, but I just had to have somebody else to kind of give me that, that, that kick in the butt. And then you run to God asking for mercy and grace, and he gives it. In verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. I'm sorry, back at verse 1, he says, blot out my transgressions. And then he says, wash me from my iniquity. David was tired. He finally got to the point where he was tired of carrying around that, that, that sin burden, that uncleanliness, that, that stench of sin on him. And he was finally begging God for spiritual cleansing to restore him into a right relationship with God. Because you realize when we're dealing with sin, we're, we're not just dealing with, with, with the guilt and the, and the shame and, 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 and just remorse. When, when we're unconfessing, when we are not confessing our sin, our relationship with God is messed up. It's interrupted. You know, I don't, I'm not sure how they do it on the phones now, but I remember, remember back in the day of the, when everybody had a home phone, sometimes you'd pick it up and you'd dial and you'd hear the operator say, I'm sorry, but the call cannot be connected at this time. That's what goes on in our lives when we've got unconfessed sin. We can pray to God all we want to. We can say we have a close relationship with Him. But in reality, the operator, Holy Spirit's telling us, I'm sorry, we can't make the connection at this time. And it takes us being cleansed, as, as, as David's talking about it. it. It's about coming to God and asking for forgiveness, and He blots out our transgression. Then we can pick the phone up, and okay, well, we, can, we can make this connection now. In Isaiah 118, we read, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. And that's all God wants to do when we sin. He wants us to confess it to Him. Not so He can beat us over the head. There are so many people today that think that we worship a vengeful God that's just waiting for us to mess up so He can beat us over the head and punish us. You know, there are consequences of sin. If I commit an adulterous affair against my wife, she's liable to say, I want a divorce. If I give in to the sin, and don't get me wrong, I believe there are addictions, but it starts out as a sin. If I give in to the sin of alcoholism, God can free me from that, but I may have developed cirrhosis of the liver. I may be a drug addict, and, and, and God miraculously cleanses me of being a drug addict, but I still, I, I, I may have physical issues and mental issues because of that. It's not that God hasn't forgiven me. It's that there, oftentimes there are consequences, physical consequences of our sin. But, but God tells us here in 50, or David's asking for here in Psalm 51, and, and Isaiah talks about the fact, come and let us reason together. Yeah. God's saying this. Now keep in mind, that when God says, come and let us reason together, God's not saying, hey, let's, let's get together and talk this out and come to some kind of compromise. No, God's saying, I'm giving you the reasons, and so let's come together. You come around to my way of thinking, you know. I, I'll never forget, I did not care for him as a politician. But I remember one time President Obama and John McCain, they were having a big meeting at the... At the, at the outset, uh, at, at the White House. And, and McCain said something about, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was about, but I do remember the president saying, well, you know what? Elections have consequences, and I won. You know, in a sense, I didn't agree with it, but, but in a sense, that's what God's saying. I, I'm, 
I'm the head bubba in charge right here. When we reason, it's you coming around to my way of thinking. And that's confess your sins so that I can blot them out, so I can take that scarlet and, and, and make you white as snow. Well, that's what David was crying out for here when he cried out for mercy. How about us this morning? <clears throat> what sin is there in our lives this morning? Perhaps things that we've been dealing with or ignoring for years, and God in His loving kindness and in the multitude of His tender mercies, He's calling us this morning to confess and to turn from and to, and to give to Him this morning so that He may blot them out and wash us as white as snow. And again, it might not be murder. It might not be adultery. It might not be stealing. But is there anybody that you have hatred in your heart, about, heart against? Well, well, preacher, I don't hate anybody. Okay, let's tone it down a little bit. Is there anybody that you have a grudge against? Is there anybody that you could not freely, if they were to walk into the church right now, hug them around the neck, and you'd love them exactly the way you do some of your brothers and sisters here at the church? Because if you can't say that, then, then that's a sin, and it needs to be dealt with. Well, preacher, you don't understand how badly this person hurt me. I understand hurt, you know. But when we compare the hurts that we experience to the hurt that Jesus Christ had to endure when he went to the cross, who are we to say, I've got the right to hold a grudge. I've got the right to be angry. I've got the right to hate somebody. Because, see, it's not the big sins that get us. I, I think it's in Proverbs uh, it says the, the, the little foxes eat the grapes, steal the grapes. You know, it, it's the, the, the little things. We, we, even as Christians, I know the, the lost world out there thinks that we're a bunch of hypocrites because we don't toe the line and, well, that you guys sin just as much as we do, you know. But we as Christ, what we as Christians sometimes forget is the fact that <laughs> that standard they're talking about even though they're being hypocritical, is the standard God expects us to keep. To be as pure and as holy and as righteous in His sight as we possibly can, realizing that it's His holiness and it's His righteousness we're shooting for because we can never, we, we can never get, attain it on our own. So how about us this morning? Is there something God's calling to us to, to, to repent of today, this morning? So we see David not only cry out for mercy, but we see his confession of sin in verses 3 through 6. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And I, I, I'll touch on the other, the other passages, uh, the, the other verses maybe here in a few minutes. But notice David didn't make excuses or blame anybody else for his sin. He wasn't like Eve who said, well, the servant deceived me. He wasn't like Adam who said, well, Lord, it wasn't my fault. It was that woman that you gave me. You know, and I've realized over the years that that, that that still doesn't cut it with God. You know, I can't go to him and say, well, it was Tammy's fault. If Tammy didn't, if Tammy didn't say this to me, I wouldn't have reacted that way. Or if she hadn't have done this, then I wouldn't have done that. It's, it's me. David didn't say, well, Lord, if Bathsheba hadn't been taking a bath naked on the rooftop, I wouldn't have done what I did. You know, he, he, he blamed himself. He said, against, you know, I committed the transgression. And, and, and he also acknowledged who it was against. You know, we, we talk in, in, in earthly terms of sinning against somebody. I lost my temper with my wife, and I've got to apologize and, and ask for forgiveness of that. But, folks, it goes way deeper and way higher than that because we've got to realize that whenever we sin, the... The, 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 the first and foremost person, if you, if you want to call it that, we sin against is a holy God. Against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. When we sin, it's ultimately against a holy God. The, and his law, the law tells us, thou shalt not, and I'm just using David's sins right here, out of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. Now, since God is the author of the law, and he is the law, when we commit sin, we sin first and foremost against God. And what did sin cost God? 
Sin cost God the life of His only begotten Son. Sin cost God, sin caused God to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to take, to not only take the sins of the world, including everybody here, it, it says He not only took the sins of the world on his, on his shoulders, but I believe it's in Hebrews, it tells us that He became sin. Can you imagine that? A holy God, nothing sinful in, in Him at all, to make a way for us, not only took on our sin, but He became the thing that He detested and hated the most. Well, God can't hate. Yes, He can. He hates sin. And so David was crying out for forgiveness. Again, what sins or sins, and I'm talking to me too here this morning, do we need to be confessing before God today? Before we can participate in the Lord's table in a worthy manner. Again, there may be people that we need to deal with in regards to our sin, but restoration and forgiveness comes, uh, it starts by coming to God, repenting of it, and confessing our, that our sin is against Him. And, and I didn't have this in my notes, but you might be thinking, well, 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 well preacher, the, the person that, that I, need to, I need to forgive, or maybe I even need to ask for forgiveness, it, they're... They're across the country. They're across the world. Or, or, or they're dead now. There's no way that I can do that. Well, how do you handle that? You handle that by going to God. You say, this person hurt me. This person sinned against me. Lord, I, I, I can't go to them uh, right now and, and tell them that I forgive them because they're, they're dead. But, but I'm coming to you. And, and I'm releasing it. Or, Lord, there's somebody I need to ask for forgiveness, but they're dead right now. I can't ask them for forgiveness. I'm coming to you. And I'm asking for forgiveness. And that's how we deal with issues like that. Now David acknowledged that the problem for, for his sin, again, wasn't anybody else. It wasn't even God's fault. You know, I, I hear people all the time say, well, God made me this way. Well, yeah, absolutely, he made us the way that we are. But if we're Christians, we can't use that as an excuse. Because the Bible tells us that as, as Christians, daily we should be conforming more to the image of Jesus Christ. The fancy theological word for that, that is sanctification. We should be becoming more like God every day. So the excuse is, well, that's the way God made me, doesn't flush if you're a Christian. And the sad thing is I've heard so many Christians over the years say, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way God made me. Well, you know, no. <laughs> to be blunt, no. You know, he acknowledged the problem of sin wasn't God, but it was himself. Now, in verses 5 and 6, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, and in sin my mother conceived me. David was not talking about the fact that, that in the act of procreation, there's sin. What he's talking about is the fact that that that, that because his first father, Adam, our first father, Adam, sinned, we all had a sin nature because of that. If you hear me say all the time, if you could look at the spiritual things in your body, and you could look at us and there'd be a, a, spiritual, a spiritual gene, a spiritual strand of DNA that's called S-I-N. And it's in every single one of us. And even after we become Christians, that never leaves as long as we're work, walking this side of heaven. What we need to do is draw closer to God. The Bible says, draw, and James, draw closer to God, and He'll draw closer to you. And, and as we draw closer to Him and strive to be obedient to Him, that, 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 that sin gene is, is rendered more and more, uh, it, it becomes more and more weak. Yeah, I don't know if I shared this with you guys or it was in Bible study, guys. Like, you know me, I'm reaching that age now where everything blurs together. This is a politically incorrect story to use, um, but a story is told of a man that uh, had fighting dogs. And whenever he'd go to a fight, he would always bet on the dog that won. And somebody asked him one time, I, I know they're your dogs, I know they live with you, but still, how, there's a 50-50 shot every time they fight. How do you know which dog's going to win? And he said, it's easy. It's the one that I feed the most. You know, as we feed on the Word of God, as we draw closer to God, we're going to have the strength to not sin as much. 
But what, ha what happens to us? And I know for sure in my life that, 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 that when I get away from the Word, when, when I get away from prayer time, I'm more prone to sin. You know, and it might not be outright sin, but it's a change in attitude. Again, going back to Tammy. Man, she can, she can nail it. You know, there have been times over the years, you know, you've, not been, you've not been doing your personal time with God, have you? How do you know? <laughs> For that reason right there. <laughs> you know. But as we, the, the, the part of us that we feed the most is the part that's going to get strongest. And if we spend time with God in His Word, if we spend time in prayer, if we spend time applying what we're learning to our lives, if we spend time fellowshipping with God's people, we're going to continue to get stronger. Another little story kind of relates to this as far as us being together. Preach, a story is told of a preacher that went to visit somebody in the congregation, hadn't been to church for a few months. And uh, it was wintertime. The guy had a fire going in the fireplace. And uh, he let the preacher in. They didn't, they didn't say a word to each other. And as they were watching the fire, one of the embers popped. And it kind of blew when it popped, it, it kind of moved itself away from the rest of the fire. And it started to die out. Preacher sat there for about another 15, 20 minutes, got up to leave. And all he did was he took that poker and he took that dying ember and moved it back over to the fire. Guess what happened? It started back up. That's the way it is with our lives. We've got to acknowledge, though, that it's us that are, that are doing, that's doing the sinning, that it's, it's not God, but that He's always ready to push us back into the fire, if, if you will. When Adam sinned, we all fell from God's grace, and that nature will live in us until we get to heaven. And that's why David asked for what he did in verses 7 through 12. And it should be our desire too. And I'm just going to read down through verse 10. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David's desire was to be pure, as pure and as holy and as righteous as he could before God. Now he already knew because he had a busted track record. He already knew he couldn't do it on his own. That it had to be God doing it. And so he, he talks about purge me with hyssop. And, and most of y'all know, know what hyssop is. It was, a, it was a, a bushy plant that while they were in Egypt, if you remember the, the, during the plagues, the night that God was sending the angel of death through Egypt, he told the people to slaughter a lamb or a goat to drain the blood and, and take the hyssop plant, dip it in the blood, and put the and, and, and paint the blood, if you will, over the doorpost and the lintel of the house, so that way the angel of death would pass by. Now, even in the days of the tabernacle and in the temple, they still used hyssop to to put over the altar, you know, and that was symbolic of the Christ to come that would pour His blood over our hearts to save us, to forgive us of our sins. So, so He's asking God to, 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 to put His blood. He was looking forward to the cross. He, he didn't realize what the, exactly what the Messiah was going to be doing, but he was, he was looking, His faith was in the, forward to the cross. Our faith is looking back on the cross. But, but He was asking God to, to apply His holy blood to His heart and to cleanse him. And in verse 8 he talks about, uh, make me hear the joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Now David didn't actually have any broken bones. He didn't literally have any broken bones. But he was speaking of the spiritual brokenness that comes with sin. And whether we realize it or not, we can be defiant and prideful about our sin. But at the very least, some of our bones are broken because, the, because fellowship with God has been broken. But for so many of us, when we sin, part of that brokenness is the guilt. It's the guilt of carrying that sin. And though we theoretically know what we should be doing with it, we act like we don't know what we should be doing with it. You know, I've committed this sin against God. What do I do? Well, again, that's why we need to be in the Bible. What's the Scripture say? 
But David was speaking of a spiritual brokenness. And it's only when we're broken, as David was here, and we acknowledge our sin and our need for restoration in our relationship with God, that healing and forgiveness can come. It's kind of like you hear all the time with, with addictions. You know, the, 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 the first step in healing comes when you admit you have a problem. And that's the same thing with us. When we, we want to deal with our sin, the first step towards healing, healing our broken bones, is to realize, I need to take this to God. You know, Because God can heal anything. I, I got one quick story I got to tell you real quick. Talking about healing. I can't remember if it was Zachary or Seth, but we were, over, we were still over at Zion. And uh, one of the boys got one of those, had caught one of those little tree frogs. And of course, as little boys do, kind of held it a little bit too hard, squished it, and it died. And then I don't think it was the one that was holding it, it was the other one said, That's okay, we just need to pray to Jesus because Jesus can heal and fix everything. You know, now it didn't work in, <laughs> didn't work in that situation because there's consequences for our actions. But, but, but in reality, God can heal anything, but it takes us, us coming to Him. In verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David wasn't perfect, but the Bible tells us that he was a man after God's own heart. And this is why. When he finally got through the clutter, he realized, I need to get to Jesus. He was like the woman uh, in, in, the, in the Gospels who had the issue of blood for seven years. And she said, if I can just get to Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made whole. David Finally, it took Nathan to get him to see it. Or, I, let me put it this way, probably it took Nathan to get him to act on it. But he realized, I need to, I need to get to Jesus. So he asked God to create in him a clean, a clean heart. His desire was an unbroken relationship with God, and it killed him figuratively when that wasn't going on. David was miserable when his relationship with God was messed up. Is it our desire this morning to have a steadfast spirit and a clean heart towards the things of God this morning? Because if not, God's Holy Spirit is calling us this morning to repentance. David wasn't speaking of, of he, he talks about uh, in verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David wasn't talking about God losing his salvation or God's Holy Spirit permanently departing from him. Rather, he was speaking of losing this relationship. God, this is the most, relationship, most important relationship in my life. Please restore it. And, and don't, don't, don't tell me, David, three strikes and you're out. As I'm coming to you begging for mercy and begging for forgiveness, restore it. Lord, please restore that. He didn't want God to take away that very intimate relationship that, that he had with God. And sadly, many of us live our lives today that look like we could care less that God's Holy Spirit lives in us. You realize everywhere we go, we take God with us. Everything we do, we take God with us. Everything we think, God is with us there. Every click, especially man on the computer, every, every click we make. And I realize sometimes we don't even have to click. You can have the best software in the world, and every once in a while something's going to pop up we don't need to see. But what do we do with it? If we have a desire to, to maintain that relationship with God, we're going to get rid of it. But sadly, many of us live lives where we, we live our lives like we could care less about God's Holy Spirit. In verse 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David realized that his salvation and his standing with God didn't have anything to do with him or how good he was or how many good works he did, but it was all of God. The relationship he had, his salvation. That's why he said, The joy of your salvation. God has salvation, and He graciously bestows it and gives it to us when we cry out to Him and ask Him to save us. When we're in sin, we have no joy. In fact, I believe there's a lot of Christians today that don't know anything about joy. They may have some happiness, but folks, happiness is based on our external circumstances. Tammy and I, just before it started raining, we had decided to cook some steak and shrimp on the grill last night. Well, I wasn't very happy to have an umbrella 
and, and, and be, be flipping stuff on the grill. But when I got, you know, my external circumstances didn't make me happy. But by golly, when that steak and that shrimp were done and we were sitting in our house with a roof over our head, guess what? My circumstances changed and I was happy again, you know. And, and that's the way it is with us. But so many Christians, they, they may know happiness, but they don't know the joy of the Lord. In fact, an old pastor, I think it was Vance Havner, said something to this effect. He said, lots of Christians have too much of the world in them to be happy in Jesus and just enough Jesus in them to not be, ha to not be happy in the world. And so they have a miserable existence. And I believe there's a lot of Christians like that today. As a matter of fact, my next question in my notes is, is that you this morning? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? But are you living a miserable life today because you're not experienced the joy of the Lord because you've got sin in your life? 2 Corinthians 6.2 tells us, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Folks, this is not just true of salvation, but it's also true of confession and repentance. When God reveals sin to us, it's time to deal with it right then, uh, then and now. You know, as soon as He reveals it to us, before our hearts become so hardened that we won't deal with it. And God will tell us, God gives us a free will, if we refuse to deal with it enough, I believe there could come a time where God will say, you know what, if that's what you want to do, go on ahead. And our hearts become hardened. And if we choose not to deal with the sin in our lives, we're going to be miserable and our fellowship with, with God is going to be broken and there'll be no joy and no peace in your life. And so my question as we're getting ready for, to, to, to go into communion is how are things between us and God? I'm going to do this a little bit different this morning. I'm going to ask Ashley to come forward and, and Miss Joyce if she, she feels led. We're going to play two stanzas of Just As I Am. Now this isn't an altar call. But what I would like us to be doing, based on what we've been reading here in Psalm 51, is just to prayerfully, just us and God, Lord, before I partake of communion, is there anything between you and me? Is there anything going on in my life that's keeping me from having... Amen. Amen. If my deacons would come forward now, please. And while they're coming forward, just want to share with you. And I know I do this, I do this every, every time, but I just want folks to remember that we observe an open communion here at Hebron. Uh, the, only, the only qualification, you don't have to be a member of our church, but you need to be a member of God's family. If you've been saved, you've been born again, that qualifies you to be able to participate. Uh, if you're here and you're not a believer, I would ask you to uh, abstain. I don't see any little ones here, but if I'm missing any, uh, I would ask you not to let them to participate. Let them participate. Uh, we love it when they emulate what we're doing as, an, as adults, but again, I believe this is such a serious thing. Uh, Paul talked about in Corinthians that the people actually, in his day, actually died for participating with wrong motives and without clean hearts. And so, you know, you can just discuss stuff with them, uh, you know, in, in, in your pew, uh, but, but don't let them do that. And uh, we're, we're ready to go. And just in case you've forgotten, we're doing the new, uh, I'm going to grab one of these. We're doing the, the new thing here where everything's contained, uh, the, the wafer and the juice. As this is passed out, if you have any, if you have a hard time, I do even with my glasses, separating stuff. Just ask one of the deacons or somebody sitting next to you. Hey, can you help me? Can you help me get the wafer out here? Because that's normally the hardest, the hardest part.
table for the body and get back to heaven. If you would offer a prayer for the blood, for the blood that was shed for you, get back to heaven. I'll get this. Before we partake, one thing I want us to remember, the bread and the juice is symbolic of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. There are some folks that teach when we, when we partake <clears throat> that somehow mystically and magically it turns into the actual body, the actual blood of Jesus Christ. And that's not true and there are so many biblical reasons behind that that I could share to prove it's not true, but we're not going to do that today. But what's going to happen now is we're going to partake with the bread. Uh, I've asked Brother Eric to uh, lift up a, a prayer of thanksgiving for the body that, that was broken for us. We'll, we'll eat that. And then after that, uh, Brother Stewart is going to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the, uh, for the blood that was shed for us. Amen. Brother Eric. Amen.
after they'd eaten the bread, Jesus passed the cup around and said, this is the new covenant. As often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Brother Stewart, will you offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for the blood that was shed for us? Amen. Amen. Guys, y'all can be seated or go back to you. Amen. Thank you, guys. I want to <clears throat> share a few announcements with you and make sure I've got the bulletin with me because the last time I did this, I, <laughs> I messed up. I do need my glasses. I want to thank everybody that came out for our uh, three nights of refreshing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We had a great time, and and uh, thank you for your support. Uh, men's breakfast Saturday morning, eight thirty here at the church. Uh, we're having a potluck, our, our uh, fifth Sunday uh, meal on October thirty first. Uh, that that's a Sunday, of course. As soon as the service is over with, uh, we're doing trunk or treat this year. And, and so uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't signed up, please sign up. Uh, we, we need all the, the folks we can get to help. That, that's going to be a way, you know, it's not just going to be kids getting candy, uh, but we're going to be handing out Bibles, we're going to be handing out tracts, we're going to be witnessing to people. So we, we really need your support for that. Uh, also, hey, I'm going to remember this one without, uh, without the, the bulletin because I, I don't see it. Uh, don't forget our October mission project for WMU is for the, the Goochland Women's Correctional Center. We're looking for Christmas and, and all occasion cards. The deadline's on the 24th. Uh, Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child, uh, is going on now through uh, November 14th. I think we're out of boxes right now, but we've got more boxes coming. Uh, so if you need those, uh, we'd love for you to participate on that. And then November 13th at 6 p.m. a Saturday night, we're just going to get together uh, for a great time of fellowship and have a bonfire. So we encourage all of you all to come to that. Bring friends and family that might not ordinarily come to church because that's a good way to, 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 to let the unchurched folks know that we're, we're not going to beat them over the head with the Bible. We're not going to bite them or, or anything like that. We're just imperfect people serving a, a, a perfect pastor, a perfect pastor. <laughs> A perfect Savior. I got to go home and repent now. No, maybe I'll just stay right here. Yeah. We're imperfect people. <laughs> We're, oh, my goodness. Worshiping. <laughs> it's those folks from Zion. It's their fault. I, <laughs> I, I do, don't I? Yeah, yeah. We're imperfect people worshiping and serving a perfect Savior, and we're just trying to show, show His love. I'm going to scoot to the back. We'll sing our closing chorus. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll have choir practice tomorrow night. Uh, so, you know what? No, let's, tomorrow's a holiday. Let's, let's, let's not. I'll make sure. Oh, I will say this, though. Ashley, if you can, and I'll get with you, I'm not going to be here Sunday. Uh, I finally got this surgery stuff for my sinuses scheduled for uh, for Thursday morning. They tell me I'll probably be out of commission for four or five days. So Pastor Carroll's gonna uh, gonna be preaching next Sunday. Ashley, again, I'll get with you, and if you could, you know, he uh, head up head up the music next next Sunday. But be praying for me. I didn't have any problem with this stuff, but and I, I'm not scared because I know God's with me. But still, I'm I know it's gonna be very. Very uncomfortable. I think I'll be taking a lot of drugs when I'm done with this one here. Uh, but uh, but let me scoot to the back. We'll sing our closing chorus. If I never.